Hello everybody and welcome back. Today I will be reading from a document I prepared. This document will be available on my website early next week. I will place a notice in my community page to advise you as to when it is available. For now I'm going to read from it. Is Charles fit to be a king? As Prince Charles is taking over more of his mother's responsibilities on a daily basis, the question once again arises as to whether he is fit to be king. Of course, this is not the first time these questions are being asked, but as the time is creeping in for this to become a reality, there is a renewed urgency in the questions being asked about Prince Charles. No human being is all bad unless he is mentally deranged and the same applies to the prince. In this document I shall not argue that Prince Charles is a monster or a deranged human being because that he is not. Charles's good deeds and successes make up a long list. His dedication to his projects, his work as representative of the monarchy, his loyalty to his mother, particularly over the last few years, stand him in good stead. But when it comes to becoming sovereign, is this man strong enough, wise enough, trustworthy enough? Does he care enough for his people and by his people? I mean all the people of Britain, also those he may consider cannon fodder. It is unfortunate, but to balance the scales, we have to inspect and look at all the controversies and mistakes he made along the way and try to figure out why he made them. There are the pro-Charles supporters who are saying that he is a kind man, a stylish and classy man, a generous man, but there are also those who are saying that he is an entitled, selfish man who overestimates his own intelligence. I shall try to keep the scenarios in chronological order, but it will not always be possible as events overlap and others took years to resolve. Diana. Diana would have turned 61 this year. On the 1st of July 2022, I am turning 59 on the 12th of July 2022. It is thus reasonable to say that we went through the same life stages at more or less the same time, likely had similar expectations and dreams. At 19, we all think we are grown up, adult and wise, but we are not. I believe that Diana, like myself, was still very naive and a child in a woman's body at 19. I believe that Diana was still too young and immature to get married at 20, let alone marry a man that much older and so much more world-wise than herself. And she definitely was not mature enough to marry into the royal family and everything that came with it. The job, the attention from the media and the public. At 21 and with all the added pressures of life within the royal family, she was too young to have a baby and to have another only two years later. Diana hardly had the time to grow up, mature and to decide on who she really was when she found herself to be a mother of two, the wife of a future king, and a princess of the United Kingdom. I can imagine what it was like for her to realize that her husband's heart belonged to someone else. To discover that her husband shared things with another woman which he did not even think of sharing with her. Royalists are fond of trying to sell the narrative that Diana had an affair long before Charles reconnected with Camilla. While it may be true that there was no physical or sexual relationship between Charles and Camilla during the first few years of his marriage, we also know 
that Camilla was indeed a constant in his life before, during and after his marriage to Diana. Camilla was always there, if not as a spectator at a polo match, then at a church service or on the other end of a phone line. For Diana, a young woman and mother largely isolated from normal life, this must have been devastating, even if she did not always consciously think about it like that. Although one would have wanted Diana to maintain the halo of purity and serenity the public placed on her head, it is also understandable that she craved love and caring and understanding and even physical touch. Unfortunately, her affairs tainted her in the eyes of many and she took all the blame. In my opinion, Charles's affair with Camilla was not his biggest mistake. Marrying Diana was. As a man in his cities who had dated and likely slept with numerous women all over the globe, a man with huge responsibilities and a packed program and agenda, a studious man who studied Jung, he should have had the common sense to know that Diana was too young, too immature to provide him with the challenge and the company he needed. But Charles had another duty to fulfill. He had to provide heirs to the throne, and as such, Diana was beautiful, aristocratic, and without a nefarious or scandalous past, she was the ideal breeder for the royal family. Although Diana admitted to affairs, Charles was indeed the adulterer, because whereas Diana, on her wedding day, likely had every intention of staying faithful to her husband, and Diana was indeed in love with her husband. It does not appear that Charles had the same intention or was as in love with Diana as she was with him. Tampon Gate A phone call between Charles and Camilla was recorded in 1989 but only released in 1993. In the call, Charles whimsically wishes he was a tampon so he could live inside of Camilla. Rather gross, but to put it in perspective, in 1989, Diana was only 28, William only 7, and Harry only 5, and the couple barely married for longer than 8 years. Lawrence van der Post Charles met van der Post in the 70s and van der Post became a close confidant of Charles's. Van der Post was many things, an author, a journalist, a soldier, etc. But he was also a born storyteller, which in his case meant that not every story he told was indeed true. Van der Post was also a student and supporter of Jung. In Van der Post, Charles had a self-appointed spiritual advisor who, among other things, seduced a 14-year-old girl and made her pregnant while he was still married. Van der Post lied about the woman in his life. He juggled numerous affairs and it is even said that the farm he bought in England and settled on with his wife and son was likely bought for him by the Queen Mother's cousin, Lillian Bowers Lyon. Many of the stories Van der Post told about himself later turned out to be pure fiction, half-truths or embellished. The close connection between Charles and Van der Post, however, remained until Van der Post death in 1996. Jimmy Savile. The first letter or note Charles wrote Savile was dated 1987 and the last in 2006. However, it is likely that their friendship endured for much longer than that. 
The official narrative is that Charles was completely clueless about Savile's depravity. But looking into their friendship, this does not ring true. What is true is that Savile had been reported to the police and the BBC numerous times, and although he was not arrested or lost his job, his reputation certainly preceded him, and a number of people suspected that the man had some serious issues. What is also true is that at some point courtiers did become increasingly worried about Charles's friendship with Savile due to the fact that Savile had free access to the palace and Charles's offices. They were also aware that Charles discussed intimate details of his work, his relationship and even the relationship between his brother Andrew and sister-in-law Sarah with Savile. It is also said that at some point Diana became increasingly uncomfortable around Savile after he once licked her arm instead of kissing her hand. Numerous stories were making the rounds about office workers in the palace after a few incidents which made the young ladies in particular rather uncomfortable. It would be highly unusual if Charles was not warned off or advised to cool the friendship at various points during their 30-year relationship. The Prince's Foundation for Integrated Health In 1993, Charles established the Prince's Foundation for Integrated Health. The foundation was established to promote complementary and alternative medicine. The charity closed down in 2010 after allegations of fraud and money laundering. Two officials were arrested and one went to jail. A retail line was created called the Prince's Duchy Originals. A retail line was created called the Prince's Duchy Originals with products as Detox Tincture, Achino Relief and Hyperi Lift. In 2009, the Advertising Standards Authority criticized email which was sent out advertising the product, saying it was misleading. In 2009, Charles personally lobbied Health Secretary Andy Burnham regarding greater provision of alternative treatments for the NHS. In 2010, irregularities were noted the Metropolitan Police and Specialist Crime Command launched an inquiry and the two officials were arrested and four days later the foundation closed. Reverend Peter Ball The first investigation into Ball was launched in 1992. Although the police felt that they had enough to charge Ball and bring the case to trial, Ball only received a caution with the understanding that he would resign his post at the church. In 1994, Charles sent his private secretary to Lambeth Palace to inquire about Ball. When he learned that Ball had not been cleared to return yet, he wrote a letter to Ball. In the letter, he berated the Archbishop, saying that the Archbishop did not keep his promise to restore Ball to the ministry before Christmas. Charles exchanged many letters with Ball over a period of almost 20 years. He even bought Ball a house to live in, renting it to Ball and his twin brother from 1995 to 2011. In 2015, Ball was then indeed convicted of sexually abusing 18 teens and young men. One of Ball's victims, Neil Todd, committed suicide in 2012 and Ball died in June 2019 at the age of 87. The sister and family of Neil Todd claimed that Ball, the church and Ball's powerful friends, especially Prince Charles, were to blame. Michael Fawcett. Michael Fawcett, who was also implicated in the cash for honours scandal involving Dr. Bin Mafus, 
joined the royal family as a teenager and was appointed footman to the Queen in 1981. He was quickly promoted through the ranks to sergeant footman and then assistant valet to Prince Charles. In 1998, after a chauffeur, equerry and valet resigned, complaints with regards to bullying by Fawcett was lodged with varying allegations against him, among which that he threw his weight around and was using his closeness to Charles to do so. In 2003, Sir Michael Pete identified mismanagement at Clarence House. The inquiry found that Fawcett received numerous gifts, in inverted commas, during the course of his royal service. Other allegations were that Fawcett was selling unwanted royal gifts on behalf of his boss and his boss's charities. However, he was cleared of financial misconduct and appointed CEO of the Prince's Foundation in 2018. That is, of course, until he stepped down again after the Mafus scandal. The Spider Letters In 2010, The Guardian, under the Freedom of Information Act, applied to see copies of correspondence between Charles and ministers in seven government departments. This concerned a total of 27 letters written between 2004 and 2005. In 2009, The Guardian revealed that Charles had written directly to a further eight government ministers between 2006 and 2009. After a lengthy battle in court, the letters were published in May 2015. Investigation into Charles's estate. In 2012 and 2013, the Commons Public Accounts Committee called for an investigation into Prince Charles's estate. According to the committee, the Duchy of Cornwall was competing on an, and I quote, unlevel playing field because it is not liable for corporate tax or capital gains tax. Cash in suitcases and shopping bags. We recently heard about the three separate cash donations totaling $3.1 million, which Charles personally received from Qatari former Prime Minister Sheikh bin Yaber Al Thani. According to Palace Aids, the money was counted and distributed into the bank accounts of the Prince's charities. Of course, why would anyone accuse Charles of stealing? The man has everything and more than he can possibly need, and the trust belongs to him anyway. So why would anyone hand over cash like that? To cover up something, to make sure the money does not go through legal channels, or to squirrel money away in another country? All of those are possibilities. And then the question is, is Charles thus aiding and abetting in a less than legal act. Dr. Bin Mahfouz. Charles and Dr. Bin Mahfouz first met in 2014. Mahfouz donated one million Great British Pounds to Prince Charles's Dumfries House project, where after the Prince personally arranged to rename a garden the Mahfouz Garden. There were further donations to the Prince's Foundation, which also went towards the restoration of the Castle of May. In 2016, Dr. Mafus received his CBE from Prince Charles in a private ceremony. Bruno Wang In January 2019, Bruno Wang posed for a photo with Prince Charles at the opening of the Health and Wellness Centre at Dumfries House while a plaque behind him read, made possible by the generosity of Wang's foundation. However, Wang is a wanted fugitive from Taiwan, and he knows only too well that he will be arrested for money laundering if he ever sets foot on the island again. Dimitri Lius in 2020, Dimitri Lewis gave the Prince's Foundation £500,000 
but the Foundation's Ethics Committee rejected it because, like Mr. Wang, Mr. Lewis was accused of money laundering in his homeland. Yet, unlike Mr. Wang, Mr. Lewis's conviction was overturned and he was exonerated. Lord Brownlow, Charles's Nakroon Echo Village, was not the success he thought it would be. Not since the start of its development in 2011 and not to this very day. After Lord Brownlow bailed out the project to the value of £1.7 million and purchased 11 properties in the project, he got the position as trustee of the Prince's Foundation and was made commander of the Victorian Order in 2018. Dumfries House was also opened for his 50th birthday and he was awarded a 1.2 million construction contract. The Isle of Scilly in March 2020, there were outcries from the residents of the Isle of Scilly with regards to the steep increase in rent by the Duchy of Cornwall. As things currently stand, the estate is the freeholder and the locals occupy their properties as leaseholders. Charles lobbied the government to exempt the Duchy of Cornwall from allowing his leaseholders to buy their properties outright, which in simple terms mean that the occupants do not currently own the land on which their homes are, and also that currently Charles and his duchy are the only landlords who are exempt from and can withhold permission to sell the land to the occupants. Because of this, rentals were always relatively low, but in 2020 and 2021 allegations were made that the duchy had increased rent from £100 to £7,000 over the last few years. Charles's stance on this freehold land owned by the duchy and the exemption of the 2001 legislation is being slated as being medieval and feudal. I was told that although efforts had been made to take the matter to court, Many of the 50 residents are fearful of the duchy. Many of these residents allege that they were not informed of the restrictions when they bought their properties. Mineral rights in Cornwall. In 2014, Prince Charles was accused of a medieval land grab after claiming the right to mine under the homes in the town of St. Austell, Cornwall. Residents receive an application for registration of mines and minerals, including powers of working and getting any such minerals. The mines and minerals lie under your registered title. The letters listed the applicant as His Royal Highness Charles Philip Arthur George, Duke of Cornwall. According to Charles, the mineral rights does not have to be in individual deeds because, and I quote, because they were granted by a 19th century Act of Parliament. Later villages in the Stoke, Climsland and other areas of Cornwall accused Charles of bully tactics after they received the same letters. Michael Wynne Parker and Ben Elliott. Michael Wynne Parker is another name popping up as a fixer, someone who sold access to Charles. According to a leaked email, a donation of £100,000 would secure a dinner with Prince Charles and a trip for two to be hosted at Dumfries House would also cost £100,000, earning the fixer a 20% commission. Tory chairman Ben Elliott, who is also Camilla's nephew, has been accused of making money from organising meetings between wealthy businessmen and Prince Charles. One millionaire claims he paid tens of thousands of pounds before dining with the future king. The World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab 
Many people are questioning Charles's involvement with the World Economic Forum. Some feel that Charles has not been schooled in economics. Others feel that his ideologies are far too far-fetched to be realistic. And then there are those who feel that the world economics should be left to the politicians and the heads of major banks, etc. to sort out. People do feel that Charles does not belong there and that it is again a matter of him overestimating his own intelligence and perhaps even power. Although Klaus Schwab's education cannot be faulted, it is known that he does hold ideas for the future of the world and humanity, which either appears rather suspect or way too idealistic or even apocalyptic in a way. Rwanda. Now lately we had also heard Charles's personal opinion on the repatriation of refugees back to Rwanda and once again this could be seen as a political matter decision made by the British government and once again not a place where Charles is supposed to wade into. Okay, now my synopsis and opinion, but first I want to read you something about the law in Britain and one which I think would apply to a number of things I have talked about before. In Britain, a company, entity or person can be fined up to 10% of its worldwide turnover can be sued for damages and you can also be sent to prison for up to five years if found guilty of anti-competitive actions. Okay, so that is the law, okay? I am now going to move on to my opinion. In all these cases, when criticized, Prince Charles shrugs his shoulders and pleads innocence. He either did not know about his alliance's evil deeds or he was not involved in any of the so-called management decisions. It is always someone else, never him. This shows an element of immaturity like we see in children. Oh, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, he says with chocolate all over his face. It also shows signs of Charles being a very weak man, someone who goes with the flow, jump on bandwagons, goes where he'll gain popularity. The alternative to him being a weak man is then that he is rather dumb or stupid. Having book knowledge and being studious never meant that someone is or was truly intelligent. And I indeed heard it said that Charles grossly overestimates his own intelligence. As future head of the Church of England, we also have the right to take into question his moral values and accountability. As future head of the Commonwealth, we have the right to question his honesty. Now going through the list above, I cannot help question his integrity and honesty. It is not for me to decide the future of the monarchy. Statistics show that countries with a constitutional monarch had, I guess in the past, a more stable government. But it also appears that Charles's money grab is not really about money, but about power. I fear that a man with little integrity, lacking in values, a weak man, an entitled man, who is perhaps not as intelligent as he likes for himself to appear, may gain too much power globally and not only hurt his own country, but cause damage worldwide. It is my opinion that a King Charles comes with way too much baggage. He may be liked and appreciated in certain circles, but there is also a lot of resentment and mistrust towards him. 
Charles is not a very likable person and never was, even though he does hold a certain appeal for people in certain circles. He does not appeal to the general population, maybe sometimes as a royal, but not as a human being. He does not have the looks or charm of his son William. People may talk about William's temper, but to date it has not gotten out of hand, and the flashes of anger we have witnessed shows strength of character, of sticking to his guns, so to speak. William is sometimes criticised for being too bold and outspoken, but again, in that way, we know where we stand with him, and we do not have the same scenario of Charles when he hides behind his mother or his courtiers. Now lastly, this piece, although based on facts and receipts, also contains my opinion which is just that, my opinion and interpretation of the facts. Even though you may not agree with my opinion and interpretation, it is good to remain informed of the actual facts and to make sure that you do your own research into the finer details of the matters mentioned above. We are all responsible for our own future and that of our children and grandchildren, and nothing good can come of sending them into the world with their eyes wide shut. This document and the words contained herein is copyrighted to myself, Lynn Lexo, July 2022, and may not be used or copied verbatim without the permission of the author. You can email me with your comments or permission to use at bookwormonthecase at gmail.com. So, that is it. Until we meet again on the next one, please take good care of yourself. Bye.